morning, Hope community and friends. Glad you chose to worship with us this Easter morning. I'm Pastor Nathan, and uh, today is a celebration of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's resurrection. From the earliest days of the church, a tradition on this day was for someone to call out, He is risen, and then everyone else responds, he is risen indeed. So kids and everyone else, I invite you to practice that with me and you can do it all day long uh, with your parents and your siblings, whoever you're hanging out with. If someone uh, calls out, he is risen, then everyone else responds, he is risen indeed. So this morning I'd like to start our service with uh, a reading from one of the Gospels. Um, all the Gospel accounts uh, record uh, the resurrection of Jesus. And in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, one of the twelve, uh, in the last chapter of the book, uh, I encourage you to turn there, Matthew 28, and we will read, uh, I will read for you in uh, Matthew 28, verses 1 to 10 and then 16 to 20. So this is basically how Matthew closes his gospel. And this is the story of the, the resurrection. Now after the Sabbath, which was Saturday, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb, and with fear and great joy they ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So Matthew then closes out his account with that encounter uh, with uh, Jesus and the disciples in Galilee. Verse 16, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Join me now as we pray together. Father, we want to come before you on this great and awesome celebration of the, the pivotal moment in your larger story plan where Jesus Christ came, uh, became fully human, lived a life um, as a human being, experienced all that we experience, and then, and then in the fullness of time offered himself as the sacrifice for sins, the, the thing that would free human beings who trusted him from the, from the bondage that, they, that the devil has them in to their sin. And we thank you so much for that and the power that was evidenced of victory over sin and death through the resurrection. We long for your appearing, Lord, when everything will be made right the way it is supposed to be. And we are so aware, Lord, during this time of COVID-19 that uh, things are not the way they are supposed to be, that the uh, the world is cursed, and, and things, uh, nature itself, basically, you could say, is, is rebelling against humanity, against human beings, the image bearers of Christ. 
So we would pray right now for those who are suffering the effects of COVID-19. They have it and they're uh, just recovering at home or in the hospital, perhaps even in intensive care. And Lord, I would pray especially at this time for Carrie, Gary, and Pam Opperman's granddaughter, who has some serious medical issues, has been hospitalized for a month, and now they just found out that she has contracted COVID-19 in the hospital. Lord, I pray a special prayer of protection for her and ability of her body to um, recover and fight off, even though she is compromised just because of the, the other illnesses that she has. And I just pray a special prayer for her and for her family uh, right now who can't even be with her. Her husband hasn't seen her for a month. And Lord, I just would pray a special prayer for that family at this time. And Lord, for all of those who are suffering some level of, of uh, fear, uh, dis disruption of, of routines, of patterns of living, and Lord, not all of that disruption is bad because it can cause us to reflect and consider, to, to call out to you and to, to increase our dependency on you. And I pray that that would be happening. For those, Lord, that are uh, subjected to um, having to be in close contact with those who are ill and knowing that they could contract it if, if the protections that they take are not, are not working or somehow they, they just forget to do something or... Something happens, we don't know how Carrie contracted this in the hospital, but uh, Lord, there are, there are risks for all those. And for the many people that are working in what are considered necessary um, functions, uh, grocery store workers and different people, truck drivers, uh, people that are doing essential tasks that could um, be exposed. And we just pray for, for them, for their protection, if they do contract it for their recovery. Lord, for governing officials who are, are tasked with the responsibility of making uh, the best decisions, uh, considering the situation, I just pray that they would have wisdom, that they would make um, not uh, overreaching type decisions, but good decisions that will, will increase the safety and the freedom of, of people, and particularly for God's people, to be able to, to function and to serve and to be uh, your light in this world. Lord, for uh, Kevin, um, who is the, the husband of Ann Gilks, who several in our community know. Lord, two weeks ago he had a heart attack. He, they've determined he does not have neurological damage, but he is still unconscious, and she can't be with him. She can't see him, and no one can be with her. She has to just be at home by herself. And so I pray for her comfort and also for the healing and, and restoration of full functioning of Kevin. And again, we would pray for our friends Paul and Sally, for, for Paul as he is in rehab now. He got transferred, and I just pray he would, he would progress very well and return to full functioning and particularly to be able to, to understand and speak and communicate, Lord. And I pray that if it would be your will, that they would provide a, an exemption, a special dispensation for Sally, who is a physical therapist by uh, training her original degree from college, that she would be able to stay and live with him for the two weeks or longer that he will be in rehab. And Lord, for us to now together in each of our little places of gathering of family units, um, as we, we gather together in spirit online, just pray, Lord, that you would draw our hearts to, together with one another in unity, but also towards you in love. We do love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for this great and awesome larger story plan that you are unfolding for us. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to encourage you uh, to continue to uh, steward your resources that God has entrusted to you as God would prompt you, um, and if our Hope Community Church is one of the, the ways uh, that God prompts you to, to give and to participate in his ministry, I uh, just encourage you to either do that online at uh, hopefrankenmuth.org. There's a, a place at the bottom where you can give, or just a mail a check to Hope Community Church and send it to 511 North Main Street, Frankenmuth 48734. So for this morning's message, as we reflect on that story of Easter, 
I uh, just wanted us to think about uh, the implications of that and what difference it should make for us as we, as we journey through our lives. This is not just, uh, you know, a story in the Bible that you, you celebrate, you dress up for Easter. I don't know if you did that at home. Um, I dressed up to come here, um, put my uh, lighter Easterish type shirt on, and uh, we have flowers in the background because it's such a, a great time. And, and our tradition is together as a family too. So we'll greatly miss being able to be with our children and our grandchildren. I know many of you are in that same situation too. And hopefully, Lord, Lord and, and for all of us, it will it'll increase our longing for the Lord's return and for his coming and for everything to be the way it was supposed to be. So I'd just like to take us to some, some passages of scripture and some thoughts and reflections and ways to think about um, the implications of the resurrection. We're in a series that I've entitled um, Our Passionate God. And uh, the three messages last week and then Good Friday and today are the idea of God suffering because of us and essentially the idea of our sin because of things that we did and the separation that that brought, the consequences. Um, God loved us so much that uh, the son was sent, his only beloved son was sent to be a human being, to experience all that humanity involves, and then to take upon himself the consequences of sin so that the bondage that human beings have to the, the evil one uh, would be released at, if they trust him, if they accept and receive the sacrifice. And so, uh, as we read in the Matthew passage, the last thing Jesus told his disciples then was to um, be a part of that, to, to go, to make disciples, to baptize, meaning, meaning to help the, the new believers to establish themselves and identify themselves as followers of Jesus, and then to be involved in their, their maturing, to teaching them to obey everything uh, the Lord commanded, all that the scripture has to say. Uh, John, one of those 12, uh, said in his first epistle, uh, he wrote the gospel and then three epistles. In 1 John 3, verse 8, he tells us that the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And so we know that, that in the appearance of Christ and his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and now being seated at the right hand of the Father, that a victory over evil was accomplished the full and complete resolution of that victory will not happen until the Lord returns. So until then, we experience the pain and suffering and difficulty, the struggle of living life in a fallen, broken world, but we do so not without hope. We do so with hope. And so the story of resurrection, the implications of the resurrection for us are the, that God has provided all that we need to journey through the lives that we will have to journey through and, and to look forward in the midst of that to his sustaining help and also the glorious future that he has waiting for us. N.T. Wright in his book, The Day the Revolution Began, has this to say about this central part of the, the Jesus story, the, the unfolding larger story of God. When Jesus died, the powers lost their power. They can still rage, and shout, but the power of Jesus is stronger, and it is the power of forgiveness. The past is blotted out. A new world has begun. A revolution has begun in which the power, in which the power itself is redefined as the power of love. So as I've been uh, teaching on this idea of the passion of God, um, I shared a little bit about my story, that I had viewed God as being impassable. Not a word I expect you to know, because I had to look it up. Um, which basically means insusceptible of or exempt from feeling pain or suffering. And if we really pay attention to the scriptures, we understand that God, in fact, is very passable, very emotion-filled, very in touch with what it means to feel. He does so without sin, but he doesn't do so by deadening himself, by shutting down 
the realization of feeling and emotion. And uh, my uh, conviction and, and uh, repentance, brokenness and repentance, had to do with the degree to which I understood that I had basically been trying uh, and believing that maturity was uh, the more impassive or unconnected, disconnected, above and beyond uh, motion I could be, the more mature I would be. And I'm realizing and on the journey uh, all the time towards the understanding that that is not the case. So it's only been in recent years that I've come to understand and appreciate uh, how, how emotional and passionate our God is and that I was made in his image. And so the more I become like him, the more I will be alive, and you can be too, to that aspect of what it means to live. Uh, fully alive, calling out to him in the midst of life. I've come to realize that if, I com and if I'm committed to being impassable, my impact will likely cause others to want to hide in my presence, feeling like I don't understand which will unhealthily and unhelpfully mute the influence and impact for good and for God's glory that I believe he wants each one of us to experience as we journey through life. I believe I, I have in the past presented a picture that others see as unattainable, a picture of impassibility, of immunity from pain, of being able to be unaffected by life. So now I do believe God is inviting me and inviting you to live in God-like passion with our hearts reflecting and pouring out to those around us the goodness, beauty, joy, and love that emanates from a God who we are told, again by John in his first epistle, that he is love. That's his essential nature. So, uh, just before... Uh, he went to, uh, actually, the day of the resurrection. I'll get to the, what he said before. But on the day of the resurrection, which I hadn't really remembered this until uh, recently we were going through in a men's group I'm a part of where we were journeying through the life of Jesus from the, the beginning days to the, his passion. And just recently we went through the passion accounts. And uh, in John chapter 20, verse 19, uh, we read uh, John's account. So here's what John has to say. We just read what Matthew had to say. John says, on the evening of that day, so uh, Easter evening, uh, the first day of the week, the door is being locked. So you get the idea of the disciples not sure what's going to happen. They're fearful. They're locking their doors. They're worried that the, the authorities might come to get them next. The door being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them. So we do know from this that the, the resurrection body of Jesus is not restricted by doors and walls and things of that nature. But it's a physical body because he could eat food. So um, that's the kind of body we have to look forward to. So whatever pains or struggles or difficulties uh, you're going through or have gone through or fearful that you might go through in this day of COVID-19, you can have that confidence that your resurrection body and my resurrection body will be amazing. Uh, we'll get to enjoy uh, food, enjoy fellowship, community, uh, be physical in our bodies, um, and yet uh, everything will be perfect and nothing will be need, will we, we need to fear. So he stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They're afraid. So he's just basically saying, Peace. Uh, shalom is the Hebrew word for that. It means settleness of soul. Irene is the Greek word. So he wants them just to not be churned up, not be anxious. And for many people today, that's what God would say. Peace be with you. In the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of uncertainty about what this means for the future, what it means for your immediate or long-range future, peace be with you, our Lord would say. And then he showed him his hands and his side. And the disciples, it says, were glad, glad when they saw the Lord. And then he said again to them, peace be with you. So he really wants them not to be anxious and fearful. As the Father has sent me, 
he says, even so, I am sending you. So same idea as what Matthew said when they went up to Galilee. So the, the Galilee account would be after this. Um, and, and then when he had said this, and this is the part that I didn't realize was here. I always thought the Holy Spirit came at the day of Pentecost. And now my understanding is that the, the Holy Spirit came with enabling power for their, with their witness. So they were filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, which would be um, the next celebration, 50 days uh, after Passover, is when the Holy Spirit came in power on the day of Pentecost. They were able to speak in languages they hadn't learned. Many people heard the gospel. 3,000 people trust Christ. But on this, the night of the resurrection, notice what Jesus does. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So on the very night of the resurrection, the 11 of the disciples, the apostles, the chosen 11, received the Holy Spirit, which Jesus had promised them. If you remember, on Thursday night uh, at the Last Supper, um, and I encourage you to turn to John uh, 14, 15, and 16. I'm just going to start with a little bit in chapter 16, and then just read these sections, these promises that Jesus made to them. And just imagine that you are there, and it's not been that long. Thursday night wasn't that long ago. So for us, it would be about the same as what we were doing last Thursday. And he had made these promises. And then they go through the whole trauma of the arrest of Jesus, the, the crucifixion, his death, his burial. They're fearful. They're afraid. They're not sure what's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, there's these reports from the women that they've seen him. And Peter and John run to the tomb. And the two guys on the way to Emmaus are having a conversation with them. They get back to the, to the disciples. And then uh, Jesus shows up in their midst then on that, that night. And, and the, then we have the, the Holy Spirit is given to them. And here's what he promised them. In verse uh, 7 of chapter 16 of John, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. They didn't know what going away meant then. But now on Sunday, the evening of Sunday, they know it meant he's going to go die. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So now he's sending him to them. In John 14 now, go back to John 14, beginning in verse 1. He says, uh, Let not your hearts be troubled, about anything, be filled with peace, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. Some translations say to say that I go to prepare a place for you, and this one's saying I would have told you that if it wasn't so. So he's told them in the past that it's better for them that he goes away because he's going to be preparing a place for us, and secondarily, or primarily, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. So literally, if you are a follower of Jesus, you can have the Holy Spirit. You can have God's presence with you, Father, Son, and Spirit. Or as, as Peter says in his second epistle, uh, we can participate in the divine nature. We can be partners with God, with him always with us, us always with him as we journey through whatever this life has to offer. In my Father's house are many rooms. So we have a place ready for us. And then in verse 3, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to be with myself, that where I am, there you may be. So we have that continual hope that no matter what our life involves, whether it be long or short, that either by our death or the Lord's return, when he comes, if we have trusted him as our Savior, and he is uh, the Lord that we are following and becoming more and more like him, our future is secure. So the, the things that would churn us up and cause us to be most fearful is what if I get something and I die? Don't have to worry about that. If we die, we're with him. So Paul literally could pray, I don't know what I should pray, Lord. I don't know if I should pray that you'll just take me home so I get to be with you, or if I should pray that you would you know, recover me, uh, bring me back to full and complete health, protect me from anything bad so that I might continue to journey and serve and do my part in your larger story during this time. So he, he didn't even know which, which way he preferred to, 
to have the thing turn out. So in, and then back, continuing down, if you look down to verse 16 of John 14, uh, another promise Jesus said was, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. In John, in Matthew 28, the last thing in the book of Matthew is, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So this idea that it's better for Jesus to go, to, to die for our sins so that we might be released fully and ultimately and eternally from the, the grips of the evil one and have new life, eternal life, and the possibility of living a different kind of life during this time that we're on the earth in the fallen world, that that, that was such a great thing, but uh, we need help. And so he said, for me to provide the help individually for every person to be part of us, the divine community of Father, Son, and Spirit, I need to do this, secure the victory, go to the right hand of the Father, and then send to you the Holy Spirit, which he did on the night of the resurrection, and he did with power on the day of Pentecost. And he promises us then, I will be with you always. So, times of social isolation, uh, and the, the gal I prayed for, whose husband is in the hospital uh, with a heart attack, um, Carrie, who's by herself. I mean, she has hospital people helping her, but uh, if, if we are believers, we're not never by ourselves. We always have God's presence with us through the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And again, it's Jesus been very much saying, if the Holy Spirit is in us, it's, it's Jesus with us, it's the Father with us, all of them are with us if the Holy Spirit is with us. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Again, peace I leave with you, verse 27. My peace I give to you. So peace was really important to Jesus, that, that he didn't want his followers to be anxious, concerned, worried about things that would happen, about the difficulties that life would would bring across their path as they're journeying in this still broken world, still under the control and domina domination, domination of the evil one, we have him with us. So nothing that the world can bring on us is, is something that we need to fear. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So, for the, the end of our message, I just wanted to say, so what are the implications of that? What do we do with that? The, this promise of the resurrection and the, and the idea that because of everything that Jesus did, not only is victory secured for the end, for eternity, so you could say, I know where I'm going when I, go, when I die, but, but God's uh, pro protection and enablement and comfort and help and teaching is available now as we journey through life. So the question is, how do we access that? How do we stay in continual, uh, as the scripture says, to keep in step with the Spirit, to be uh, continually in community with the divine uh, presence, to be partakers in the divine nature, as Peter says. So I would just say, if you're not yet in Christ's family, so two categories, those not yet in Christ's family, those who are in Christ's family. So if you're not in Christ's family, you're not yet a part of the divine community, then the first thing to do is to accept, to receive, to believe, to trust, and receive what Christ has promised and what his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, appearances, ascension, and interceding for us at the right hand of the Father and sending the Holy Spirit to us, all of that, to access all of that, which is freely offered to anyone who believes. You just have to receive it. You just have to accept it. You have to trust Christ. Uh, in verse 6 of chapter 14 of John, which we were reading, it, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's not about trying hard or being sincere about something or trying to be a good person. Uh, not that followers of Jesus don't uh, put effort into their journey with Jesus, but it's not in order to secure a place or acceptance by God. It's because they are accepted by God, truly and, and completely 
uh, part of a family that they just it's so awesome to be a part of family I know when we all get these social isolation restrictions removed it's going to be so awesome and hopefully we'll, we'll much be much greater in our appreciation and our gratefulness for the joys of community with each other with the people we love and then in John chapter 1 and verse 12 Jesus says to all who did receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So receive, believe. That's the way. So if you have not yet done that, I would just encourage you. Remember, Easter 2020, when we all were worshiping online, that was the day I trusted Christ. I became a part of the family of God. God's Holy Spirit came and started indwelling me. And then I became one of the followers of Jesus, the family of God, who has the Holy Spirit, and so the second main point is, if you've already trusted Christ, you're part of his family by faith, uh, then the, the response to the resurrection story, to Easter, to the coming of the Holy Spirit, is to embrace the peace-filled new way living with Jesus and like Jesus that he makes possible through the Holy Spirit, which is what I would call passionate aliveness, not uh, impassive impassibility that's not that it's passionate aliveness where we are number one and there's three things I'm going to share with you number one paying attention to relational intimacy with God I just call that walking with God we're paying attention to the fact that God wants to be in community with us wants to us to pour out our hearts to him wants us to to share with him to communicate with him to to feel like he communicates with us, to sense that we are actually in intimate relational community with him. We're not just all kind of impassively uh, letting whatever happens happen and we're gonna power our way through it by our own strength. That's not how Jesus did it. That's not how he wants us to do it. So what that involves is involves uh, remembering who we are in Christ, that he loves us, and that his ongoing presence is with us, just like I just shared with you. It means remembering that we can come to him and be helped by him now. Peter says in his first epistle, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. The author of Hebrews says we can come boldly or confidently to the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God wants us to do that. 40% of the Psalms are laments, pouring out our heart, crying, asking God why, why are you doing this? Don't you remember you said... And, and just like we as parents or grandparents are totally okay with our kids or grandkids saying those kind of things to us, and it makes us feel like they really trust me. God wants us to feel that way with him as well. It means remembering the great future that awaits us when Christ returns so that we do not have to worry, concern ourselves, be anxious about our immediate short-term future here on this earth because that's not ultimately what matters. Now, we can you know, be wise stewards of what God entrusts us and journey through and make the best next decision, whatever comes up. But ultimately, that is not where, where our future is, where our life is, because we're laying for ourselves, uh, up for ourselves, treasures in heaven. That is where our eternal future is, is hoped and it was secure in that. And finally, remembers, it means remembering his call to us, be active participants in our process of transformation and maturing. In 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, he says this in this way. He says, train yourselves for godliness. Now, he doesn't mean it's all up to us, but he does mean we participate in it. So it's the same word you would use if it says, you know, uh, I talked to someone the other day uh, and, and they said they put on a few pounds during the the social isolation time, more snack time, I guess, more just what do we do, you know, there's some snacks or food or whatever, and so maybe less exercise and more eating. Um, so as you would say to yourself, yeah, yeah, I can't wait till this gets over so I can train myself again, get back into some routine of exercise. That's the very same word. It's the word we get gymnasium from, the Greek word that says train yourself to be godly. So basically he's suggesting here that there are practices or things that we can do that, that enable us or, or put us more into the arena of being accessible to the provided help that God gives to us through his Holy Spirit, through his word, and through his people. Um, 
So some ideas for that is just, you know, getting a routine of reading God's Word and reading it as if God is speaking to you through the words that are in Scripture. And asking, before you start reading, just say, okay, Lord, what, what do you want to tell me today? Show me what you want me to see today. And then when you notice something, pay attention to it and maybe even jot it down in a, in a journal, like something like this. It's just one of those little exam books, uh, composition books. Uh, something where you just know things that you sense God telling to you, uh, prayer requests on your heart, having an ongoing conversation with God. And then uh, practicing, you know, you, you, we have those moments when we sense something like, I wonder how so-and-so is doing. And I had one of those moments uh, the other day, and I was just thinking about a friend from far away and just wondering how he and his wife were doing. And... You can easily just like wonder that and then go on to the next thing. And I just said, you know what? I won't call him right now. Got him on the phone, talked to him for a while. Promptings, uh, uh, nudgings that the Holy Spirit had might involve, uh, you know, sending a text to someone in this time of social isolation, uh, texting, making a video, doing, doing something to try to connect with someone and trying to, to be tuned in to what the Holy Spirit might be prompting you to do. Now, the second uh, way that uh, if we're a follower of Jesus and we're embracing what that means, a peace-filled new way of living that comes and is possible through the Holy Spirit, would be to pay attention to relational intimacy with others. Pay attention to relational intimacy with others. And basically, I would just call that community. So pay attention to the, the call that we have to be a community, to be a family, so that uh, what uh, it is said in the scriptures was characteristic of believers is they knew they were Christians or followers of Jesus because of their love, because of their relational commitment to one another, to serve one another in love. And if we're paying attention to that, we will courageously and vulnerably pursue knowing others and being known by them, letting ourselves be known, loving, serving, encouraging, and sacrificing for other people. So as Paul says in Romans 12, 15, we should rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. The author of Hebrews says, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together. Wish that could be the case right now. We are meeting together just in spirit, but soon we will be able to meet together again physically. So don't neglect, connect, to, to be relationally uh, committed to and involved with and sharing with other people, but it says encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we're aware a future great and awesome is coming and we're in this period now where it's kind of a long hard road. Uh, if you've ever seen the, the movie The Lord of the Rings, little hobbits are taking the, the ring um, to the you know, the fires of Mordor to destroy it because it's basically the ring represents kind of the, the, the complete desire for personal uh, freedom from any other control and be the powerful one. What Satan wanted uh, in the God story is what the, the ring of power is in the Lord of the Rings. And they're journeying in a very difficult uh, journey throughout the whole story to get this ring and destroy it so the, the forces of evil can be destroyed in that story. And I believe J.R.R. Tolkien is picturing there the story of God and the Jesus story. And it was a long, hard battle, but in the end, awesome. I mean, they were rewarded and honored because they journeyed well through that story. And that's what we can look forward to. So uh, third and finally, pay attention to our mission or our purpose from God's perspective, while we journey through our lives down here. So when Jesus breathed on the disciples the Holy Spirit, he's basically saying everything that you need to do, that I'm calling you to do, that is your part as you journey through your story, as part of my larger story, all, all that you need for that, I have given you. So you need to focus and pay attention to and think about what is my part? How can I be part of God's larger story as I journey through my smaller story. And uh, Scripture calls that keeping in step with the Spirit, uh, just being tuned in. And so when enablement is needed for major stuff to speak or act, 
I would, I would describe that, and I believe Scripture describes that as being filled with the Spirit. So in those moments when we think we're beyond our own capabilities, but something seems to be calling to us, we sense the Holy Spirit saying, go do this or say that or insert yourself in this situation for good, uh, we can trust that God will enable us and give us the words to say or the, the direction or the enablement, the power to do what we need to do. So... Um, Remembering then, as part of this mission, that God provided um, what, whatever it is that we need so that we can be his representatives, his, uh, I like to call it, his um, partner, companion, ambassador, agents. Whatever our, our life story is, wherever we work, wherever we live, whatever uh, situation or background we have, we can function as God's partner, companion, ambassador, agents. And it could be as though he is speaking through us or he is acting through us. And there's something very exciting and, and, and awesome about knowing that that's what our story is about and that we are, in fact, doing what it is that God wants us to do during our lives here on this earth. And I, I can assure you this, everything you do with that kind of motivation, with this mission, doing my part, God's larger story, God is keeping track of that, paying attention to it, that's what it means to lay up our treasures in heaven. And those are the things that Paul was looking forward to and not wanting to be disqualified from receiving the prize, the, the reward that comes from that kind of life. So, uh, in closing, uh, Philippians 2.15, I think is a great uh, word for us to say, what does it look like to live every day with the implications of what was made possible through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul says in Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and innocent. This is the picture of how he wants us to be and what our lives would look like as we journey through them. Blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, doesn't mean perfect, just means we're continually keeping in step with the Spirit. If we mess up, if we do something we realize was insensitive, if we have a bad attitude about something, immediately confess. Lord, that was, I don't know what I was thinking, I, that was wrong. If we need to go make it right with someone else, we do. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. So there is no promise in scripture that until the Lord returns, the world we find ourselves in or our current situations and circumstances are going to be like, completely pain-free and no difficulties or struggle. That is not the promise of Scripture. But in the midst of those things, like we're going through right now, we can stand out. And he says, among whom you shine like lights in the world. Another translation says, like stars in the universe. That's who we are. That's who he wants us to live like. Lord, thank you so much for your larger story that include, included your death as a payment for sin so that we can be released from the bondage of the evil one and your resurrection that evidences your power over sin and death and your return to the right hand of the Father. You're interceding for us. You've sent the Holy Spirit so that the divine presence is always with us, that we are continually and regularly in your presence and we should view ourselves and imagine ourselves as never alone, always with you. And Lord, I just pray that for each one, uh, that they would sense that in increasing measure of continue to walk, to keep in step with your spirit as they go forward. And particularly the, during this time of social isolation where the, the encouragement that comes from the community of God's people being together is not something we're experiencing other than through uh, digital means uh, or notes or letters or different the ways that way. Lord, we long for that to be taken away. But more than that, we long for your appearing. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now in benediction, I'd like to just share a kind of an extended benediction, but this is the way Peter, who ended up being the leader of that first church, this is the way in his first epistle that he kind of summarizes the implications of the resurrection. And we'll just share these in closing. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's the reward. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith by the Holy Spirit, 
for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. And he's not talking here about justification, becoming a child of God by faith. He's talking about the future salvation or rescuing from the, the, what the, those who are not in Christ will experience. So that's our future salvation. Uh, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. I don't think there's anyone listening to this right now that hasn't been grieved by various trials in their immediate past of their story and even today. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, might be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The awesome time when everything will be made right. Through, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. God bless you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. See you next week at 930.